Hello, my name is Father Boniface. I'm a Benedictine priest and monk of St. Vincent Arch Abbey in Latrobe, Pennsylvania, and so grateful to have this chance to talk with Father Corwin Lowe, who is a Dominican and is going to be sharing his journey of faith with us. Father Corwin, it's great to talk with you. It's great to be here. And, and let's turn to Our Lady for a moment and just ask for her prayers for us and uh Special grace to talk to you. We're recording this on the Feast of St. Dominic. That just dawned on me. So we'll ask for his uh, intercession for you as one of his uh, faithful sons as well. And uh, ask for, for Mary and, and St. Dominic and uh, whatever other patrons and angels to, uh, to pray for us and help us to see how the Lord has been at work in your heart. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. St. Dominic, pray for us. Well, Father Corwin, can you uh, just start us out, maybe just giving us a little bit of uh, biographical data to get a kind of a picture of you, how how uh, long, where you, where you are, uh, uh, what Dominican province you belong to, and how long you've been ordained, how long you've been with the Dominicans, how old you are, just a few of those kinds of things. Okay, well, I currently live in Menlo Park, California. It's a stone's throw from Stanford University. I have been a Dominican since I entered the novitiate in 2006. I was ordained to the priesthood in 2014, and I am 59. So if you're doing the math, I entered rather late in life. <laughs> I was born and raised <laughs> in Seattle, Washington, where uh, I, my family still is, and I love it there. Um, California is a bit different, both culturally and environmentally. And uh, one day I hope to get back, but for now I have a mission, and that is in California. I joined the Western Dominican province, which is based in the Bay Area. And um, I joined the Dominicans, well, I'll get to that in a bit, but I had no idea that I was going to be a Dominican. And when I found out that uh, they are the order of preachers and I would have to go back to do a lot of study, I thought, are you kidding me? <laughs> it's, it's not really what I planned. <laughs> when I graduated uh, from the University of Washington up in Seattle, I thought I was done with school forever. Never say never, <laughs> especially when our Lord is <laughs> Yeah, so take us take us into that. How did uh, faith develop in your life? Well, um, my parents are very faithful Christians. Uh, they took uh, me and my three siblings. I have two brothers and a sister. I'm the third, and my sister's the oldest. And we went to church every week, every Sunday without fail. And we also did after school Bible. Um, Bible camp for Protestants. That was um, a big thing. And we spent a lot of time memorizing uh, Bible verses. So we had a really good foundation. My parents thought that was important for us to have both a faith life and strong moral and ethical values. And so they, they saw going to church and being involved with the church as being uh, important components of formation for people that are growing up. And um, I admire them very much for doing that for us, because it's not so much done in our culture these days. But my parents, they, they are immigrants from China. Um, my mom was born there, although she came over when she was very young. My dad actually was born in California, not really that far from where I am. And, but he lived on a farm. And so it was um, kind of uh, working the land and didn't have a lot of interaction culturally. It was just him and his family working on the farm. Mm. But he and my mom both understood the uh, America as being this land of opportunity. So he was the very first um, boy in his family to graduate from college. And so that was a very big deal. So by the time us kids came around, his kids, he saw the value of education and where it could take us. And so we were all very much encouraged to go to college and to get degrees. <coughs> Excuse me. 
my parents really wanted us to have a better life for ourselves um, more than uh, they did as immigrants. So um, education was a key component to that. But I would say that my, my parents were kind of like the precursor to the so-called uh, tiger parents. Have you ever heard that term before? No, I don't think so. <laughs> it's, it's the tiger mom uh, name has much to do with uh, Asian mothers who encourage their kids to excel to the point of um, being a little bit oppressive. My parents were never like that. They just encouraged us, or encouraged us all to do things to help us th through whatever we were doing. So we were all encouraged to uh, learn music. I took the piano. We were all encouraged to play sports. So little league, soccer. My parents um, realized that we're scrawny, small, so they never, they never uh, exposed us to football or anything like that. But, uh, uh, <laughs> formation was really a big deal for them because they wanted us to have all the tools necessary for us to uh, succeed in life. And, and I admire them a lot for that. So um, I'm very happy to have had the childhood that I did, even though at the time there was grumbling <laughs> often. <laughs> but uh, again, I, I mentioned that we were encouraged to get an education that encouraged in the Chinese sense is sort of like, you're going to college. So <laughs> um, <laughs> voluntold, <laughs> as they say. Uh, Yes, exactly. So I, my, my dad got a degree in uh, aeronautics and astronautics from um, San Jose State. Uh, so he kind of set the bar high. And so our degrees were going to be engineering or medicine or dentistry, you know, all these high um, middle class um, professions uh, because you should do well. And so I went into electrical engineering and computer science at the University of Washington. And um, it turned out that I was very, very, uh, I, I just took to computer science really well and I loved it. And I thought, I'm going to do this for the rest of my life. And uh, I was up in Seattle and Microsoft had just um, started to come into prominence. And there was always this, oh, I just want to be um, in an emerging software company like Microsoft. So um, I eventually didn't work for Microsoft. I worked for um, a gentleman named Paul Allen who started Microsoft with Bill Gates. Um, Paul That's Allen amazing. left Microsoft early on because he was diagnosed with cancer. And so he had to take a leave of absence and um, be treated and it went into remission so that thanks be to God, he got another lease on life. So when he came back, he started another software company and that was the software company that I went to work for. And it was uh, the ground floor stock options. I was gonna make it really, really big. And, um, you know, the world's my oyster. <laughs> so that was kind of what I was expecting about three years into it, I discovered I hate programming. <laughs> so That's all of this work for s studying um, to be a software developer or software engineer and uh, getting to that point, uh, I thought, wow, I just don't like this. And, and, and to be honest, it, I like programming. It's just that too much of it is go into a dark room code all day long. Maybe you come up for air like once a week to meet with people uh, in a, an engineering meeting or a design meeting or something like that. And you interact with people and then you go back into your room for another, you know, umpteen more hours. And we were always kind of in a crunch mode because we needed to ship a product. And so that meant working excessive hours through the night on weekends. And so it, it consumed all of my time and a lot of that time was just in isolation. And I thought, ah, just this is not doing very much for me. I need to have human interaction. I need to talk to people. I need to, you know, help solve problems that are 
not so amorphous, but, you know, you know, tangible problems. And so mm -hmm. that's when I decided to leave and become a consultant because consultants look at people's problems and then they assess them and come up with a game plan, solve them, and then move on. And the area of consulting I was in was, at first it was software development, <laughs> but it, it was at a much smaller scale. So I could, I could help people at the end of the day or at the end of the week say, you know, I solved a problem and now I'll move on to the next problem, as opposed to these long-term projects that have multi-year right. um, goals and, and so it was really that sort of thing. Um, but my first client was Paul Allen. <laughs> so it was a little bit weird. <laughs> um, I left his company to work for his company in a different capacity. It was at this time when I discovered that consulting in very cutting edge areas was going to be where I needed to be. And so this was the early 90s and nobody had really heard of the internet. And so I took on a business partner uh, and we were uh, commissioned to write a book about the internet. Now, this was a long time ago. Nobody writes a book about the internet these days because what are you going to say? <laughs> I mean, it's everywhere. And, and to put it in, even the book um, was several hundred pages. It was thick. This was at a time when computers really couldn't even connect to the internet. So some of it was kind of a do it yourself, how to hook up to the internet, you know, using modems, dial up. Uh, so it was, it, it was a different world then. But since we had kind of that secret sauce of how to do this, and we were uh, asked to put it in book form so that other people could take advantage of it. That was like a big deal for us. So we uh, wrote the book. It was an instant bestseller. It sold all of the editions, I think, sold 750,000 copies. So it wow, was a pretty big deal for amazing. a tech book. <laughs> um, Seriously. So yeah, it was, it was wonderful. And so my my me and my business partner we just um thought about like what what can we do next and so we sort of used the royalties on the book to start a new company and that company um, was chartered to do not just um computing but security because we knew that security was going to be a big deal with this internet everybody connecting to everybody um people need to have privacy, they need to have a surety um, of what they're doing is legitimate, um, and all the sorts of things that you hear in the news. And so we uh, became a consulting company and specialized in computer network security. And our first job, our first big job, um, was to attach Microsoft to the internet. Because <laughs> that seems like <laughs> nice. So <laughs> but back in 1994, there were a whole lot of concerns. They didn't want the whole company on the internet. You know, that um, they're uh, from management standpoint, they didn't want people spending all their time on the internet, going places they shouldn't go, waste, sp wasting their time. Um, they didn't want their trade secrets to go out the pipe either. And uh, they didn't want ha hackers to come in. So since we had specialized in security, uh, that's we spent like nine months working with their um, IT group to uh, make sure that when they attached to the internet, we could monitor and filter and block and all sorts of things so, and log um, all sorts of activity. Um, and so that was a real big feather in our cap. We, that's what kind of made us, uh, in addition to the book, so we started getting all these clients from Fortune 500 companies all over the United States, and we did very, very well. Um, we we consulted with the military, Boeing, a lot of banks, uh, law firms. Wow. In the Seattle area, there were a lot of biotech companies. So uh, wow. we yeah. helped them attach to the internet and communicate with each other. So this was this is all like whirling around with me. And I, I was having the time of my life. But after um, a while, I started to wonder. And that wonder 
came into like, okay, so I've achieved not necessarily the pinnacle. I wasn't never, I never wanted to be a Bill Gates or a Paul Allen, but success and finances, they were all kind of put into my lap and what am I supposed to do with it? And, you know, I took advantage of the, the kind of newfound wealth that I had. Uh, I traveled, um, I did whatever I wanted. I could buy whatever I wanted. It was, it was sort of surrealistic. <laughs> like this was happening to me cause I'd never seen that much money before, but, um, oddly enough, it was kind of a point where, well, what do I do next? Is it just mm. make more money or invent the mm. next thing or connect the next? So I, I was sort of anticipating like, what would my life look like in say five, 10 years? And the only thing I could think of was like more money. I didn't necessarily want more fame because fame just has all sorts of bad things associated with it. I just wanted to be able to figure out where I would be. And that's when I started doing more extensive travel. And oddly enough, the intellectual property attorney that I engaged with the Microsoft contract, he's a faithful Catholic. You know, I, I didn't think that an attorney would ever be a friend of mine. But the very first time I went to his <laughs> office, I entered his office and I looked to the right and on his kind of shelf, he had some icons. Hmm. Definitely the Blessed Virgin Mary, but also um, he had a crucifix. And, you know, being raised as a Presbyterian, which I'd never mentioned before, but that's what the faith tradition my, um, my family was involved in. Um, I knew what, what, it, what it was, um, but I sort of asked the sort of loaded question, what's this? <laughs> and he, his answer really surprised me. He, he turned to me and said, well, it's a daily reminder of who's in charge. Oh, wow. So I thought about it. And um, I thought, wow, a lawyer coming up front with that statement. Wow. That's pretty bold. So um, that got me thinking and he sort of planted the seeds and he and actually, he and I actually became quite good friends and I um, was invited to his home um, several times. First time um, I went to his home, it was very clear that his home life was the most important thing. Well, his relationship with God was the most important thing, but his home life was, had priority even over his work which to me was like, what? <laughs> my whole life is defined by work. <laughs> and I think that's true of a lot of people, but um, it was flipped for him. And he, he works, he loves his work, but he also you, is, is very clear that his work is what helps him provide for his family and gives him the opportunity to be with his family. Mm. And so... Um, Fast forward to 1999, so he had been my intellectual property attorney for about uh, seven years. And I invited him and his two sons, who were 10 and 12 at the time, to go to Rome. Oh, wow. And because I was going to take a class, and um, I just thought they would like to tag along. You were going to take an IT class? No, 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 no. It was, I have a bunch of weird hobbies. One of the hobbies that I have is this um, interest in epigraphy. I don't know if you know what epigraphy oh, is, nice. but it's the study of inscription. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> um, that's cool. It's just one of those things that I picked up and I was fascinated with. And I had taken a class in 1997 in Rome uh, about uh, in imperial and um, republican Rome inscriptions. Um, all over monuments. And so the next, in 1999, there was another one that started in Rome, but also went to Florence, and that was going to be more Renaissance. But um, I thought I would invite them to the Rome part and uh, just take them. And since I'd been to Rome at, um, before, I would just show them around. So this is where it gets kind of interesting. Uh, before we got to Rome, we stopped in Milan. And uh, I thought, oh, we'll just... We'll just go to where the Last Supper is, of uh, the Da Vinci Last Supper at um, a place called Santa Maria delle Grazie. And so we went there and 
the line was out the door. And so I thought, I don't think we're going to get in and we have to catch a flight to Ro Rome from Milan. So we, they said, well, we have to go to mass. Uh, so why don't we just go to mass at this church? Which by the way, Santa Maria della Grazia is a Dominican church. Just wanted to earmark that. <laughs> <laughs> by so, the way. <laughs> so, so we went to mass and actually I wasn't really that interested. Um, so they went to mass and I was sort of walking around um, staring at the church. I was thinking, and they, they're from Seattle, uh, as was I, and the largest church in Seattle, I think, is St. James Cathedral. Santa Maria della Grazia was like easily five times bigger than that. So they're like <laughs> in awe of this whole place. And then I thought, you haven't really seen the Duomo, the cathedral of Milan yet. And uh, so we went there and we entered the church and I was going to um, sort of show them the stained glass um, starting at the nave. And so when I got to the nave, I turned around and they were gone. I'm like, what happened to them? They hadn't made it inside the door without sort of having this very profound religious experience. And that's when I determined <laughs> that I was clearly there as a tourist and they were there as pilgrims. And this, mm. this had substantial meaning to them. And so I, in my head, I was calculating, okay, I have to redo the itinerary because, you know, stopping in at St. Peter's in the Vatican for an afternoon is not going to cut it. <laughs> so <laughs> so um, they really showed me Rome more than I showed them Rome. I could give them the technical, you know, details, the data on, you know, what this is and what that is. But once they got that, they were like, oh, this is where such and such. And so I was like, really, how do you know all of this? So they're very engaged with their faith and as part of their, um, part of their upbringing is to research these things. By the way, my attorney is also a convert. So, uh, and he is a, a, nice. a more feisty character than I am. I, I was because he came from <laughs> nice. an evangelical tradition. And so it was hard, you know, going from an evangelical to Catholic is harder than going, than going from um, Presbyterian to Catholic. Because Presbyterians aren't really super anti-Catholic. So, but there are a fair number of evangelicals that are hostile to the faith. So he had to really engage a lot. So... Um, that's when, that was kind of that pivotal point for me. It's like, oh, there's something else to this. It's not just about architecture. It's not just about grand buildings. There's really something behind this. So, um, we came home that, that trip was in September and, um, I decided to return to Rome for Thanksgiving. Now they don't celebrate Thanksgiving, but it's, I have this tradition where I would go somewhere different every year. And so I went to Rome for Thanksgiving and I, I, I called up my attorney and I said, I'm gonna go to Rome and um, I'm not gonna really be a tourist. I kind of wanna just sort of let the Holy Spirit do whatever it does, <laughs> he does. <laughs> and he goes, well, you should start with going to mass. And so I, I said, okay, well, where do I start? And he, he said, well, you have to find out where you're gonna go then he gave me the basic outline of the, the order of mass and he said go to saint mary major i don't know if you've been to rome before but um that's one of the four basilicas and so yes. i went there and uh so they have off to the left um the chapel where mass is normally celebrated the the main the high altar is used really for big events on sunday but for daily mass it's in this smaller chapel and when I say small, it's ginormous compared to whatever we've got. And it's all very Baroque. <laughs> right. Um, but they always have this guard outside and he's, he's not there to like arrest you or anything like that. <laughs> he's just there to make sure that the people that are interested in praying are going in and the people that are interested in staying and taking pictures and gawking don't interfere with that. But in my mind, it was like, how do I get by the gatekeeper? <laughs> And so that made me very nervous. And when I got in, I, f I felt like he was watching me, even though it was completely untrue. And it was in Italian. And um, I, I just couldn't shake the feeling that everybody was watching me. 
And so it was not a very edifying experience at all. And so I called up my attorney and I said, yeah, it didn't really work for me. He goes, oh, don't give up. Try another church. This time, try something smaller. So the next morning, my hotel was um, on the Aventine Hill. And so I had a little bit jet lag and I got up early in the morning and went for a walk. And um, I stepped into this church called Santa Sabina. It's at the top of the Aventine Hill. And so when I stepped into the church, I thought, I wonder if it's, well, before I stepped in, I, I, I asked myself, I wonder if it's even open. And of course it was. And I walked in and it, I thought, wow, this doesn't seem very secure. Remember, I'm in security because <laughs> um, all the lights were off. And uh, so I walked in and I was like, this is such a beautiful church. And actually, I had been there before on my epigraphy tour two years earlier. But um, when I walked in, uh, I noticed that I really wasn't alone because off to the side is the Chapel of the Blessed Sacrament. And of course, I didn't know what the Blessed Sacrament was at the time. So I walked towards it and there were, I would say three or four Dominicans. They were wearing their hoods up um, because it was cold, it was November. And they were adoring the Blessed Sacrament that had been exposed. Um, of course, again, I didn't know any of this, but I was like, oh, so there are people here. And I remembered from the schedule that mass started around 7.15. So I thought, oh, well, why don't I, why don't I go to mass here? <laughs> they have a choir in the center, you know, choir stalls. And so I thought, I bet you that's where they do mass. So I kind of snuck into the choir stalls and I sat there. And uh, about 10 after 7, I hear this click. The sacristy door opens and the lights are neon gas lights. I don't know if you're familiar with those types of lights that are typically used in gyms, but when you turn them on, nothing happens. And then over a period of like a minute, they get super bright. Mm -hmm. So I'm in the middle of the choir and I think, wow, this light's getting really bright, really, really bright. And so bright, there's there was no disguising that I was there and I was just gonna observe. And so I kind of was thinking, well, what's gonna happen next? But then this stream of Dominican friars started to come out and it seemed like it was never going to end. Then I realized, what if there's no room for all of them to fit into the choir <laughs> and I'm sitting in the choir? Uh, but fortunately, there was enough room. Oh, boy. And uh, <laughs> I almost got up and left. I, I, I literally stood up and said, I'm out of here. And then I thought, kind of this voice at the back of my head said, this is really why you're here. So why don't you just shut up and, you know, sit down. So I sat down. Nice. And um, the Dominicans uh, at Santa Sabina do mass, but they tie it to morning prayer and they do it in Italian. So I've got my little cheat sheet and it doesn't make any sense. <laughs> it was clear, uh, sort of my frustration. I was trying to be, you know, not obvious at all, but one of the friars came up to me and handed me a Psalter and pointed to the Psalter, uh, to the place where they were, <laughs> and which it worked nice. for like one Psalm. And then I was lost again. But, um, you know, that was my first exposure to kind of morning prayer and mass together. And after it was all done, you know, I got up to leave and one of the friars came around the corner, uh, around the outside of the choir and met me at the gate of the choir. And he said, he said in Italian, so are you Korean? And I said, no, I'm an American. And <laughs> he goes, oh, really? I'm from Chicago. And I'm like, really? What are you doing here? <laughs> and so he, he said, you know, he basically gave me the, the two second tour of Santa's being. I said, we here every morning, come back if you're inclined. You know, so I did. I came back the next day and um, he came around again and I said, do you want to come for, in for coffee? And I'm like, who does that? <laughs> but I said, OK. So I went in for coffee and he this this is funny because he handed me a cappuccino. And I don't like coffee. And so I'm sort of choking it down. And I, at, at one point I said, Father, I really don't like coffee. And he goes, oh, don't worry. There's tea and other things to have here. So he just sort of asked me what I was doing. I said, well, I'm, um, I'm just here absorbing um, 
whatever Rome has to offer. And he goes, so are you on vacation? And I'm like, not really. Um, and then he asked me what I did. And I said, well, I do, and this is always a really difficult question. When you do computer network security, when that comes out of your mouth, you might as well be speaking Greek. So I said, well, I work with computers. <laughs> and he said, really, I have a problem with my computer, which is very typical of anybody. Yeah, and, I know. <laughs> um, and so he's like, can you help me with that? And I'm like, and then he stopped himself. He says, no, wait a minute, you're on vacation. I said, well, I'm not really on vacation. And he goes, oh, well, I'm having this really, really dire problem. And I said, well, okay. So he goes, oh, wait a minute, I have a nine o'clock appointment. Can you come back at 11? So I said, sure. And so I came back at 11, he let me in. We talked a little bit. Um, I, his problem was his computer um, lost his address book. And without his address book, he couldn't mail anybody in the world um, uh, that he needed Ooh. to. And so I, and I said, well, a after poking around, I said, yeah, it's corrupt, but I, and I can't restore it. But if you happen to know their name, I can write this little script that you can enter their name and it'll, it'll do a search through the whole corrupt document and come Cover. up with the, nice. the text around it. And, and so that'll help you if you, it won't reconstruct your, your address book, but if you know what you want, you can get it if anytime you want. And so he goes, Oh, that's, that's awesome because, you know, email addresses are like phone numbers. Nobody remembers them anymore. <laughs> so, um, you know, he asked me if I, um, wanted to stick around for lunch and I said, sure. So he invited me to lunch. And I don't know if you know anything about Santa Sabina, but it is the Curia for the Dominican order. That's where the master of the order lives. Right. And right. Um, so he, I was invited to lunch. The master of the order was there. Um, the tables were divided into language groups. There was English, English, French, Spanish, German, um, a lot of people there. And um, so I got pushed into the English group because that's what I spoke. And um, that was my introduction to the debate. <laughs> so like, how did this happen? That's amazing. Um, wow. And that's really beautiful. And, uh, yeah, it was, it was really, really grace filled. And that was like two days of my trip. That was only three days. And that was only like 10% of what happened to me that weekend. Um, it, it was wow. really like somebody was trying to send me a message. So I came home and the reason why I was staying at a hotel on the Aventine Hill is a friend of mine, the, the guy that uh, taught the class on epigraphy, he was living on the Aventine and we thought we would hang out together a little bit, uh, not too much. Um, he was there for a year. And so I got an email from him in January and I asked, he said, hey, I'm coming home and he lives in Seattle as well. And I said, oh, really? Um, I thought you were going to stick around for a year and because it had only been like four months. And he said, yeah, I got homesick. I can understand that. So I blurted mm. out in email, like, so what are you doing with your flat? And he said, well, I'm giving it up. And I responded, can I have it? And he said, nothing for a week. And huh. then another, uh, an email came in and said, it's yours. It's all been arranged. And I'm like, I was just kidding. <laughs> so oh, wow. but then I thought about it. It's like, maybe I could make this work. And so I talked to my business partner, I said, Hey, I kind of need a break. And I'm thinking about uh, taking a work sabbatical and moving to Rome. And he goes, okay, sounds good. And uh, then oddly enough, I said, well, I really can't go because I have all of these clients, maybe a hundred different clients that are all kind of in various stages in the hopper. But within a week, almost every one of them had come to a natural pausing point. And I said, actually, I could do this. I could make this work. So I moved to Rome and, um, I didn't stay there for three months. I stayed there for a year and a month. So 13 months. And wow. what I would do, and, and I, nobody told me this, but it's just what, how I naturally, um, it naturally played out. His flat was my, my friend's flat was on the Aventine. I would go to morning prayer and mass, even though I, I wasn't Catholic because I like chanting with the um, Dominicans um, at 7.15 in the morning. And <laughs> I have to say the Dominicans are terrible chanters. <laughs> so to compensate, I would go to the Benedictines at Sant'Anselmo um, at 7.15 in the evening 
and do Vespers. We're with very them. happy about that. You're and always that, welcome. <laughs> <laughs> and that was <laughs> that was my day every day. And I discovered that I was wrapping everything about my day around those two events, which is what the church asks mm, us to do amazing. if we're doing the divine office. And I didn't get any instruction for that at all. It was just what I wanted to do. And I would often be in the middle of something in my a flat, and I would hear the bells at St. Saint Anselmo. And I was like, oh, if I go now, I'll make it. And I'd run up the hill <laughs> and be there. And um, it's odd because uh, I didn't know anything about the divine office. I just really wanted to chant. And the Dominicans did the four-week Psalter, and the Benedictines did a different Psalter. <laughs> so it wasn't yes. even consistent. We're but, so generous. But it was... It was really beautiful, and um, the the am amount of graces that came that year was incredible. Within two weeks of being there, and by the way, when I came back to Rome and I landed at Santa Sabina, um, Father Jerry, who was the priest that uh, was from Chicago, he wasn't there, and I knew he wasn't going to be there as he was a socius for Latin America, and he could be gone months at a time. But all the people that were at the English speaking table from that one breakfast just a few months earlier recognized me and they invited me in again, even though, wow. you know, they'd only met me for breakfast and lunch. And so I kind of uh, struck up a relationship with the, uh, the secretary of the master who, who's also from the United States, from Savannah, Georgia. And he worked for Southern Bell, which was one of the baby bells. And his, Crazy. He, he was more technical than I was in certain aspects of telecommunications. So we had a lot to talk about. Um, wow, that's amazing. When I got sort of situated there and I was going to morning prayer every day, and you know, this took about a week and a half, one of the friars came up to me and said, hey, are you going to see the Holy Father? And I said, well, uh, no. And he goes, well, he comes here, meaning Santa Sabina, every Ash Wednesday. Um, the penitential walk from the Benedictines to the Dominicans. Correct, correct. <laughs> and so he said, well, do you have a ticket? And I said, I didn't even know I needed it. I didn't even know this thing was happening. And he goes, and he just pulls under, out from under his habit. He hands me a ticket and he says, here's a ticket. Be here a couple hours early and sit next to the aisle. And I'm like, okay. So I, for Ash Wednesday, I was there. Pope John Paul II was the presider, um, uh, and he wow. did that without fail uh, every year. And when he uh, finished the Mass and was um, doing the recessional, he walked right up to me, and I, he and I locked eyes. And there was something about that moment where, you know, I always looked at the, the Holy Father as, you know, sort of this politician. But it, what was communicated to me was this man was the shepherd for the church on earth. That's how, that, and that's like an incomplete mm -hmm. um, description. I just can't really describe it, but it, I, was, I was fascinated with that sort of revelation. And he's just not, I mean, he acts as a politician as well, but that's like a minor role compared to his right. um, larger really struck role you. of bringing souls. Yeah, yeah. So that was within two weeks of being in Rome. <laughs> and, wow. Um, my friend, the, my new friend that uh, was the secretary for the Master of the Order, um, Father Michael, he introduced me to a number of Benedictines at San Anselmo and um, uh, some Franciscans. And there was this kind of rumor going around that there's this guy from the States, that's me, that knows a lot about computers and he'll help you solve any problem. <laughs> oh, goodness. So I was running around doing all these sorts of things, which really isn't my profession. It's just sort of like, it's just something that I picked up along the way. But um, at one point, the Dominicans, there was a Dominican at the Vatican Museum, uh, the patroness of the arts office, and he, he needed some help. So he was asking around. And so he, my friend, uh, Father Michael, asked, uh, asked if I would go to the Vatican Museums. And I thought, okay. So um, I was, the 
director was an American Dominican and we chatted a lot and I could help him with various things. But one day he got a call from the Vatican internet office and he said, could you go over to the uh, internet office? They're having some difficulties. And um, I said, sure. So I went over to the Vatican internet office. The director was on the phone. So I didn't want to look like it was eavesdropping. So I was sort of backing away and looking around the office, the big bookshelf. And on the bookshelf was a copy of my book. <laughs> so I pulled it out and I said, oh my goodness, hey, this is, this is me. And uh, so the director looked at me and said, well, would you like to help us with uh, um, some problem solving, uh, problems that we're having? And I said, sure, what, what do we have going on? And it was World Youth Day 2000. And they wanted to know how to do streaming video, which, you know, is commonplace today, but in 1990 or in 2000, it was right. hard to do. And um, there was no, there were not a lot of standards. Um, it was just difficult to do. So I had experience in it. And so I worked at the Vatican internet office doing that and a number of other things for about six months. And I just thought, how did I end up working at the Vatican? <laughs> um, yes. Somebody's trying question. to tell me something. Um, and I wasn't even Catholic. I'm, and I would consider myself sort of a nominal Presbyterian, if that. Uh, but clearly, God was trying to communicate something to me. And my gig was up when I asked, there was a CD on the director's desk that said the encyclicals of John Paul II. And I picked it up and I said, what's an encyclical? <laughs> and so huh. the question was asked me, are you Catholic? And I'm like, no. <laughs> and so that was the sort of the beginning of the beginning or the beginning of the end, however you want to put it. And so wow. uh, I sort of in earnest um, started doing a little bit of apologetic research um, into the faith. And in 2001, at the Easter Vigil, I was supposed to be... Um, actually baptized and uh, received as uh, confirmed um, by the Holy Father. They had arranged all of this stuff for me. I didn't even know. And then wow. they said, wait a minute, you're, you're, um, you're a Presbyterian. Were you baptized? And I said, yes. And they said, oh, that's so oh, sad. Well, that's because not work. <laughs> they don't, you can't be baptized twice, as you well know. <laughs> um, and they right. don't have, they don't, um, they don't split the right like most of us do in the States. So I, they said, um, so we, we plan to have you um, received into the church by the Holy Father. It would have been Pope John Paul II. So it wasn't a letdown. Why? Because so many people wanted to see me received into the church. And when you get anything by the Holy Father, you get like two tickets, one for your father and one for your mother. And that's it. And everybody else is left out in the cold. Not, not... I mean, things, it happens at such a large scale right, that right. you realize why they have to do that. So um, the Dominicans arranged for me to be received into the church on Easter Sunday. And um, wow, there were oh, uh, 70, 70 people there, 70 people. So none of those people would have been able to um, be right. received, uh, be, be able to witness me being received into the church had I been um, um, confirmed by um, the Holy Father. And Father Corwin, we have to uh, pay a little bit of attention to the to the time, and I want to make sure to at least get the uh, the last couple of uh, data points into place. You've led us along an amazing path, and and if I can also just note a couple of the places along the way that you've brought us in your interior journey, uh, a journey marked with a really good family life and a lot of affirmation from your parents, support and education. Uh, discovering the real gifts to do technology, writing a very successful book, consulting company, some really providential connections with people that brought you into the heart of success in the most success driving area uh, in the development of the internet and security. And then 
having so much success, still finding a restlessness in your heart and that there's something mm -hmm. more and that you're made for something more and just being open to that. And, and then this kind of providential uh, cascade of connections that brought you into Rome to get a flat on the Aventine, to connect with the Dominicans and uh, the Benedictines, even uh, Franciscans and eventually into the Vatican and uh, just finding your way steadily into the, the embrace of community, the beauty of Catholicism, and, and then uh, ultimately a, an understanding of the Catholic Church that I'm sure was also satisfying to your mind that could uh, lead you to the point of, of receiving the sacraments of initiation at, at uh, Easter 2001, if I'm tracking the timing correctly. Correct. And, Correct. Uh, and, and then... Uh, it must have been another uh, several years before you entered the Dominicans, or how did that unfold just uh, in, in brief? <laughs> when I ended my time, my sabbatical, which was an extended sabbatical, and I came back to Seattle, it was like the wind had come out of me. I mean, like, I could still do my work. Uh, I was developing product, buying companies, buying technology, merging companies, I was doing lots of things, but at the end of the day, it was like, why are you doing this? Um, there was a sort of thing in, in my ear that said, why are you doing this? And what's it all for? And so I kind of reflected on my time in Rome, which, you know, I realized was not complete reality. It was, you know, it was kind of staged for me to help me along, but it, it wasn't where I was destined. Um, and so... I had a number of discussions with my business partner and um, I said, you know, I need to not do this anymore. And we decided to sell the company. And this took about four years. I didn't discern to go with the Dominicans until like the last year when I was trying to figure out, well, what am I gonna do next? And I reflected on the, the times that made me happy was being in community, um, being able to discover um, the faith in and the, the history of uh, and theology are just so deep, and I just never put any time into that um, in in my business career or my technical career, or my engineering career, and so a lot of these much bigger questions came to the surface, like why are we here? Who is God? <laughs> I mean, very simple ones at the at the time, and so I thought. You know, I think I'm just going to try out the Dominicans. And so after I sold the company, I took a year off and discerned to join the Dominicans. Um, I entered the novitiate a year later. And um, it's not to say that it was a completely bump-free ride. <laughs> I mean, it's religious life. You know that. You know what that's like. Um, it's a big shift. Yeah, it's a big shift. I did not have an easy time in formation, mainly because... Uh, I had so much experience and I was much older and all my classmates were 20 years younger than me and their, what motivated them and what interested them were different than what I was seeing. That's not to say that I was better, but I was just in a different stage of life than they were. So, mm -hmm. but, but the dichotomy of age was, um, and I don't want to say maturity cause that's not it. It's just the things that interested me, um, were different. And so that was very hard. And plus, you know, having a ton of practical business experience um, made me, I mean, you've been in religious communities. Superiors didn't start out as administrators. <laughs> they kind of... <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> grace. <laughs> and, and sometimes it, um, it stuck and sometimes it didn't. <laughs> and so, right. I, you know, I, right. I, had a, I had a difficult time. As far as our province goes, we really only have two tracks. One is t um, further education, such that we would teach in in our schools or to work in our parishes. And I knew that I wasn't going to be an academic, so I ended up going the parochial route. And that parochial route um, mostly was in the Bay Area, but then I got assigned to Portland, Oregon, our parish up there, and I was there for five, almost five years. And then just last year, my provincial called me up and said, you know how you started in business and throughout your formation, you really were interested in evangelizing to the business community. I think it's time for you to do that. <laughs> 
So he asked me if mm-hmm. I wanted to move to Seattle or, or to Silicon Valley. And I said, well, I really want to go to Seattle, but it makes more sense for me to be in Silicon Valley. And so my new charter since as, as of last year, uh, last fall, was to evangelize to big tech. And wow, that's awesome. Praise God. If it sounds like a daunting task, it is. But I'm doing, I'm making inroads and um, I'm meeting a lot of people. And one thing I do know about tech is a lot of people are supremely unhappy in their jobs. They might have all the money they need. They might have success financially or or fame or whatnot. But at the end of the day, they're, they, they suffer from depression. A lot of their demands are controlled externally. They don't have control of their own lives. Um, and so I want to be there for them to help them bring the light of Christ um, in any way I can, which is interesting because I just recently got permission to celebrate mass and one of the larger um, tech companies. Wow. That's very cool. So I haven't started yet. I think, I think that will be in September. Yeah. And that's like, whenever I mention that to somebody, I don't, often mention who it is because it hasn't happened yet. I don't, I don't want to rock the cart, but they're like, how did you do that? And well, it's like, did, it took a lot of inquiry, but, um, I think it's going to happen and I've got all the permissions to do it. So that's amazing. Well, Father Corin, we have to wrap up our program, but, uh, we'll be, uh, definitely praying for you in that venture. So excited to learn about your journey of faith. I, I could just be uh, nerdy with you for a while. I actually have a doctorate in computer security and uh, have a little background in some of those spaces and appreciate uh, some of the pathways that you've trod. And I was just in Rome, in fact, in Santa Sabina a couple of weeks ago. And uh, so anyway, oh, wow. you're, you're touching on a lot of places that are really uh, very uh, precious and, and meaningful to me and just really appreciate you and appreciate the, the journey that you've walked in this this path from um, gosh, you know, the, really the world's religion in so many ways, and especially with the, uh, the internet security, with the development of, I mean, right along the, the fundamental developments that are just the backbone of how our world functions at this point. And, uh, and then for you to bring that fully into the, the Catholic faith and to discover a, a more transcendent purpose, we might say, um, not opposed to, but rather, uh, that can really elevate all of that good work that, that people are doing. And, in uh, science and technology. So, so grateful for you. And you can certainly count on our prayers for your, your mission. And uh, we'll be posting all of that and, and asking for all of our online folks to uh, pray for you as you minister to online folks and those who are, who are bringing about the, <laughs> the technological advances to make all that possible. So thank you for, for sharing all that. Could you give us a prayer, uh, a blessing and, and offer a prayer as we conclude? Yeah. Oh yeah. My pleasure. Yes. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Gracious Heavenly Father, we ask a blessing upon all of our listeners uh, that they may respond to the whisperings of the Holy Spirit and do their uh, work and their vocation, fulfill their vocation abundantly for the glory of God. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Father Corwin Lowe, thank you so much for sharing your journey of faith with us. It's been great to talk to you. Thank you so much. God bless you.